And so continuing our Heaven Bible study, we're in part 46 tonight. And I mentioned last week that it may be to the end of the year when we finish up with Jeremiah, but I think we might actually be able to wrap it up the next couple weeks. Uh, as we look at tonight, it's going to be chapters 39 through 47. But last week we did look at chapter 34 through 38. And we saw that God is in control of life and death. And that's a theme that has come up many times as we've looked through the Scripture. And we'll actually see it again tonight. We also see that God offers the choice between life and death. If you remember before the Babylonians came, Jeremiah warned them. He warned them multiple times. And as God had presented what Judah needed to do, for one thing, they needed to just repent. They needed to, to trust Him, to follow Him. So God has given them the option that if they stay in Jerusalem and if they submit to Babylon, there's a choice between life and death. So we'll see again more of that tonight. Also, we saw last week that God's word does not change. Remember, the king was angry as Jeremiah's words were written down and he tore up the scroll and threw it into the fire. But we see that God's word continues to stand in Babylon did come. Uh, for a final destruction, and we'll talk about actually that particular verse tonight. Also, we see that only those that are forgiven go to heaven. You know, we all have a problem, and it's a sin problem, and it's a problem that separates us from God. But the good news is God gives us a way to be saved. And as we look at the Old Testament, we see that it is always by faith, trusting God, turning to God, that the Old Testament saints were saved they were looking towards the cross. And now we look back to what has been accomplished on Calvary. And we understand it is by grace through faith that we are saved. And we should just celebrate every day the great privilege we have to be called the children of God. But as we look at our heaven definition tonight, heaven is a spiritual realm where the greatest intensity of God's presence dwells eternally. It is a holy place because God is there. It is where God rules from His throne in the heavenly temple with the resurrected Jesus at His right hand. Holy angels and the souls of the redeemed, those that have been forgiven by grace through faith, live in heaven. Satan currently has access to the heavenly courtroom and accuses the saints daily. One day, Satan will be cast out of the heavenly courtroom forever. The souls of the redeemed saints will be reunited with resurrected and glorified bodies and will dwell on earth with Jesus for a thousand years. After the millennium, God will create a new universe on earth. Heaven will come down to earth, and the redeemed will live forever with God in a glorified body on the new earth. So if you would turn to me tonight to page 5. And again, we're going to be looking at chapters 39 through 47 tonight. If you haven't noticed by now, as we've been going through this Heaven Bible study, we're really taking a survey of the Old Testament. I mean, we really are seeing the big picture, and I love that we're really getting to dig into it in this manner, too, because I, that's a question I've had people ask before about how do I understand the history of the Old Testament? And, you know, the history is very important. I think whenever I really got a grasp on the history of Israel, it made the Old Testament make so much more sense. You really understand things in better context. So as we're taking our time going through this, we see how God had um, called Abraham, and then Abraham uh, said that all nations be blessed through him, and eventually the promised land happened, but you know there was a detour in Egypt before they got into the promised land, and eventually they had kings, and Judah and Israel split apart. Israel was eventually taken away by the Assyrians, and now we come to the Babylonians. And that's the first verse I wanted us to look at tonight. This is from Jeremiah 39, verse 6 through 8. So everything that has been leading up to what we're looking at, here it happens. Babylon arrives. But you remember, this is not the first time Babylon has been in Judah, in Jerusalem. They had actually had three, this is the third of the three major deportations but Babylon was always there. They weren't just like missing from the scene. So they were ever a presence in the area. But they come in and they're going to just bring utter devastation to Jerusalem. So Jeremiah 39, 6 through 8 says, Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblah. The king of Babylon also killed all the nobles of Judah. 
Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with bronze fetters to carry him him off to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. And as you look at 2 Kings, we see that they also destroyed the temple at the same time. So walls being gone, that city no longer had any protection. And the temple being gone, now the center of worship in Jerusalem was gone. And you see that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, They had Zedekiah, who was the king they had put in place. But Zedekiah had revolted against Babylon. And now everything that Jeremiah had predicted is coming to pass. And Zedekiah's sons are killed before they put out Zedekiah's eyes. And they take him off to Babylon. And again, they destroy everything. See, they also killed the nobles of Judah. And I think I mentioned this last week, but one of the attacks that Babylon would do is when they would go into an area... They would usually take the craftsmen, the nobles, the mighty warriors out of an area and they would leave the poor. And that's exactly what happened in Jerusalem. And actually we see another passage in Jeremiah that the poor had opportunity to actually have great harvest when they were there by themselves. Well, one little side note of this passage. So it says here clearly that the sons of Zedekiah were were killed before Zedekiah's eyes. The Mormons have an, a very interesting story about supposedly one of Zedekiah's sons. Have y'all ever heard that before? So they say, they claim in the Book of Mormon, that Mulek, one of Zedekiah's sons, it's not mentioned, obviously, in the Bible, fled when the Babylonians arrived. It went across the ocean and arrived in the United States, well, in America. <laughs> So it was the Mulekites, and then they had the Nephites, and I think there were like supposed to be four peoples of Israel that had come to the Americas in the, that era and established their church or temple or whatever. Completely made up. Book of Mormon is a bunch of garbage. <laughs> Actually, some of this, uh, the documents that they have of their founder that said that this was the Book of Mormon, they have found out after the fact that it's actually the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Don't know how he got a copy of it. He didn't know what he was reading. He was making up stuff. But they said that Jesus you know, came to the Native Americans and the United States. Just a lot of crazy stuff. That's just a little side note of, of crazy for you tonight. <laughs> so our first question, what is heaven? Now we notice that the word heaven is often used to describe the atmosphere or the sky. And that really in context is mentioning is the sky in this passage because a lot of the pagans would worship sky gods. And this particular instance, it is a sky goddess, the queen of heaven. And this was mentioned earlier in Jeremiah too. I think it was one of the first lessons maybe we went through. But this is from Jeremiah 44, 16 through 18. It says, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. So these are the people that are left behind in Jerusalem. They've asked Jeremiah for a word from the Lord, but look at their their attitude. (laughs) As for the word that you've spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. Have they not been paying attention? Jeremiah had told the truth over and over again, and Babylon had come just like he had predicted. But they're not listening to him. And what he's telling them is not to go to Egypt. And we'll see that passage in a moment too. It says, But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth. You remember the theme Jeremiah keeps talking about? What's our heart? So what's coming out of our mouth? What did Jesus say? It comes from our heart. They were following their heart. And this is what they wanted to do. They said they wanted to burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food, were well off, and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. They just didn't understand, did they? Jeremiah told them the truth. 
But they wanted to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven. Now this is probably Ishtar or Ashtoreth, uh, two different names from the same sky goddess. It's considered the wife of Baal and Molech. You remember those two have continued to come up. And um, this was also a fertility goddess, which was interesting because with the fertility goddess, you had a couple of things going on. One thing is in their temple, one way the people would worship was temple prostitutes with the fertility goddess. And also, the women tend to really like the fertility goddess. Because, I mean, having children was the thing. You know, you wanted to have children, so they wanted these fertility goddesses to bless them. And that was actually a major problem in Jerusalem was that the Jewish women were following after this fertility goddess, this queen of heaven that they wanted to sacrifice to. Now, this is just a, a, a little side note. Do you know what the Roman Catholics call Mary? the queen of heaven. Now, you would think that they would not match that name up. Now, the Roman Catholics have a lot of problems with their beliefs about Mary, but they're really blending Christianity and paganism together in different ways. But I thought that was another interesting little bit. But here, they're saying, when we worship the queen of heaven, just like our fathers and the kings and princes did, we had plenty of food and were well off, and we saw no trouble. But where are their fathers and their kings and the princes now? Well, they've been judged because of what they were doing. So if you have the wrong diagnosis, you're going to have the wrong treatment. You know, that's true in medical. You hear about people having the wrong diagnosis, and they end up dying because the doctors missed something. Well, this was the same problem. It was a spiritual problem. They had the wrong diagnosis. The problem wasn't they were, that they didn't worship this false god. The problem was that they didn't worship the true god. And actually, this is the same thing with the Romans as the Roman Empire was crumbling. They blamed the fact that they had left all their gods of old and Christianity was such a, a dominant force at that time. They said, it's obviously the, the gods are mad at us because we've ignored them all this time. Wrong diagnosis, you're going to have the wrong treatment. You see, the still, they still have a problem. People still have a problem today. People are searching for hope and satisfaction in all the wrong places. And places are not going to satisfy. And places are not going to grant them eternal life. You see, they think the problem is something maybe on the outside of what they do or what others do. But as Jeremiah points out over and over again, the problem is in the heart. The fact that we are not our own God. Our heart is deceitful. We need to listen to God's word. And that's exactly what Jeremiah was bringing to the people. But they wouldn't listen. And that brings us to this next point. About who goes to heaven. What's those who obey, obey the voice of the Lord. You know, throughout scripture, we see a contrast between the followers of God and those that rebel against God. And as we have established in this study, those that are followers of God are the ones that go to heaven, not the rebels. So the followers are the ones that hear God's voice and they obey God. So this is from Jeremiah 42, 19 through 22. The Lord has said concerning you, O remnant of Judah, do not go to Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. So there's the word. They wanted Jeremiah to pray to God and say, we're going to do whatever, whatever God tells us to do. So Jeremiah prays because they're wanting to know, should we go to Egypt? Babylon, you know, is coming back. We think there's going to be trouble if we stay in Jerusalem now. And God clearly tells them, don't go to Egypt. But look at verse 20. For you were hypocrites in your hearts when you sent me to the Lord your God saying, Pray for us to the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord your God says, so declare to us, and we will do it. How are they hypocrites of the heart? Well, they already knew what they wanted to do. It didn't really matter. They had liked the confirmation from God to go to Egypt, but they were going to do what they wanted to do. And Jeremiah's like, You already knew that. Why were you asking for a word from the Lord? So verse 22 and I have this day declared it to you, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God or anything which he has sent you by me. 
Man, their problem was for a long time, wasn't it? Remember last week we looked at 605 B.C. was the first deportation, but 627 B.C. was when Jeremiah started prophesying to people. We're at 586 now. That is a long time. God's Word continuing to go to the people. And I'd say we see God's patience, don't we? He was patient with the people. But here he says it plainly, You have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God or anything which He has sent you by me. Verse 22, Now therefore know certainly that you shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, in the place where you desire to go to dwell. That was the same thing that Jeremiah said to the people in Jerusalem before Babylon came. Remember he said, Submit to Babylon and you won't die. But if you don't submit to Babylon, you are going to die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. And now as they try to run away from broken down Jerusalem to go to Egypt, God says, if you do that, you are going to die by the sword, by the famine, by famine, by pestilence. And isn't it a shame these people survived the major conquest of Babylon, and now they're about to run away to Egypt to die. They just wouldn't listen to the Lord. And their hearts weren't open to what the Lord was having to say. And when they went to Egypt, they actually took Jeremiah and Baruch, the one that was writing the scrolls for him, with them to Egypt. So who goes to heaven? Well, it's not the wicked. And these people were wicked, for they would not listen to God. This is from Jeremiah 44, 9 through 11. It says, Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers, the wickedness of the kings of Judah, the wickedness of their wives? So there's that fertility cult problem. Your own wickedness and the wickedness of your wives, which they committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. So the people had been spared death when Babylon came and destroyed the walls and the temple. They're about to go to die in Egypt for the same sins that the people that had already died had died for. Now why do you think they pointed out the women then? So I mentioned it about the fertility cult, but I mean, what's significant about the women going after wicked things? Well, usually they follow the male, not the female. Mm-hmm. And usually, the women are the last ones to be corrupted in society. Paul mentions that in Romans. When he talks about um, homosexuality, actually, he's like, even the women! Because that's unusual. Men, men are pretty bad. <laughs> We're all sinners, but men are usually leading the charge in sin. So for the fact, for, the, uh, for society to decay the way it had, that even the women were in it, it was a bad state that they were in. So all this had been going on. He said, have you forgotten it? Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers, the kings of Judah, their wives, your own wickedness, your wives' wickedness, everything that you've been doing? Because what happened to those people? They were judged. They were judged. Verse 10, they have not been humbled to this day, nor have they feared. They have not walked in my law or in my statutes that I set before you and your fathers. So here's a description of the wicked. They have not been humbled. They're not listening to God's correction. They're proud. They're proud of their, their heart, the ways they're doing. They're not repenting. Also the wicked. They have not feared there's no fear of God in their eyes. And that is certainly a description of our society now. There's no fear of God in their eyes. Also the wicked have not walked in my law or in my statutes that I set before you. God had given them the way. The law showed them how to be a holy people. And they should have followed Him, but they wouldn't listen to Him. And you know, the law didn't just give instructions for righteousness. It also gave them instructions in how to repent how to turn around and how to be cleansed, how to stand before the Lord as a holy people. But they wouldn't listen. In verse 11, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for catastrophe and for cutting off all Judah, for God to set his face against someone. It's the worst possible thing. And that's exactly what hell is. It's God setting his face against people. You see, sin separated the people from God. And He was not going to look upon them. He says, your sin has turned me away from you. Ironically, 
the Jews that were taken away to Babylon. Do you know what happened to the Jews that were taken away to Babylon? Many of them were weaned off idolatry. For as they returned back into the land, that was not the major problem anymore, was following idols. Not that it was all gone, but a lot of them changed their ways. And Daniel, I mean, is again a great example of a Jewish man that was taken away to Babylon. I think he was probably already a faithful follower, but you've got the people coming back in the land. They're ready to follow God. But here these people are going to Egypt, and they're just going to go right back into the pagan practices they had been practicing before. And one of the areas they actually went back to was at, right outside of Goshen. Now, why is that significant? Well, that's where they were in slavery. Yeah, that's where they had been slaves at. Man, talking about full circle. They go out, and now they're willingly going back to this same land, that same area. It's just, it's very sad when you look at the story of Judah, of Israel. But man, is this not the story of the church as well? Look at history over and over again. We need a revival, don't we? We need people that are actually going to listen to God and to follow God. Paul David Tripp, who is a pastor and a um, a speaker and writer, I saw a, a quote from him recently that was really good. He said that people often... Or say they're looking to God for guidance when in fact they haven't done what He's already told them to do in the first place. Think about that. They're looking to God for guidance, but they haven't done what God has already told them in the first place. That's so true. There are people who are like, why does this keep happening? Are you following God? Are you listening to His Word? The people of Judah were not listening. So how can we know anything about heaven? How can we know anything about God's will? That's really special revelation. And that's what we have in His Word. And that's what Jeremiah was bringing to the people, a special revelation from God. This next part, this is actually Jeremiah 40. I think it's 39 on your page, but it's Jeremiah 40, 2 through 3. So when Babylon came into Jerusalem, Jeremiah didn't die. Now, we say, well, God obviously protected Jeremiah. But do you know how God protected Jeremiah? Well, he went to Egypt with them, didn't he? He did, but they're not yet. They haven't gone until after the destruction. So he did end up going to Egypt with them. But when they first came and destroyed the walls and everything, he was still in prison. And King Nebuchadnezzar said to his uh, captain of the guard, don't kill Jeremiah. Don't kill Jeremiah, but let him do whatever he wants to. If he wants to come to Babylon, if he wants to stay here, that's fine. But he ends up being taken to Egypt after the fact. So all the complaints that Judah has been making after the destruction. Why do you think the king of Babylon didn't want Jeremiah to be killed? Well, he was telling them to go. go he was, wasn't he? Go with them. You know, I can imagine they were really celebrating. It's like, hey... This guy's on our side. You know, he's, he's, he's said the truth all along. And he said, don't resist us. Don't kill Jeremiah. But you know, you see God's sovereign hand. Because it really is. shouldn't have been that way, should it? <laughs> but Jeremiah was protected. God was faithful to the prophet. This is Jeremiah 40, 2 through 3. It says, And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God. So notice that, your God. You know, the pagans didn't deny the existence of God. They just thought there were other gods too. But he says, The Lord your God has pronounced this doom on this place, so on Jerusalem. Now the Lord has brought it and has done just as he said, because you people have sinned against the Lord and not obeyed his voice. Therefore this thing has come upon you. That is a stinging (laughs) rebuke of the people. The people have the word of God and they refuse to listen. Now you have this pagan Babylonian who says, this is the doom that your Lord had pronounced. Now he's brought it. He did just as he said, because you people have sinned against him, not obeyed his voice. Now this thing has come upon you. Man, what a rebuke from this pagan captain of the guard. He recognizes that God is, God is real. You know, the people were often afraid of the one true God. You know, when they came out of Egypt, they were afraid as Israel was approaching them. It wasn't because of Israel, 
because of God. And even Babylon recognized they weren't going to be able to conquer an area unless God allowed them to. So this special revelation of God had been given, and it seems the Babylonians had been hearing this prophecy. You know, there's probably uh, spies in the land. However, it got transferred in all those years from 627 to 586. They were aware of Jeremiah's prophecies. Now, the next part, Jeremiah 44, 28 through 30. So this is going back to the Egypt. So this is after the walls have been destroyed, the temple, and they got the poor people still in the land. And they're trying to decide what to do. It says, Yet a small number who escaped the sword shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah. And all the remnant of Judah who have gone to the land of Egypt to dwell there shall know whose words will stand, mine or theirs. So we've got special revelation. So you remember, what did God tell them? Don't go to Egypt. They went to Egypt anyway. Now what is God telling them? I want you to see whose word is going to stand, yours or mine. Verse 29, And this shall be a sign to you, says the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my words will surely stand against you for adversity. You go to Egypt, here's a sign that I'm against you. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies and into the hand of those who seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy who sought his life. They thought they were safe in Egypt. And this Pharaoh was actually the Pharaoh that had originally gone to help Israel or help Judah fight against Babylon, that when Babylon came, they retreated. Same Pharaoh. And now the people are going to Egypt, this same Pharaoh there, and he says, here's the sign. When that Pharaoh dies, realize judgment's about to fall on your head, just like it did in Jerusalem. And it's, there's a couple of different contradictory stories outside of Scripture about what happened to this Pharaoh, but um, Amasis, Amasis, I believe, was his um, chief of his military. He did revolt against this Pharaoh, and one legend goes that he strangled the Pharaoh in front of the people. A sign to the people that God was going to bring judgment upon them. So would they listen? So what some other things that the Jewish people maybe believed about uh, life and death? Well, this was the same from last week. That God is sovereign over life and death. What does it mean that he's sovereign over life and death? It means that he is in control. He is in control. This is from Jeremiah 39, 15 through 18. And give a little context when we get here. Do you remember before Babylon came this last time, the Jeremiah, the people were mad at him, and they threw him in a dungeon, and he sunk down in the mire. Do you remember that? And he was going to die down there. He didn't have any, any food down there. And there was a eunuch that spoke up, an Ethiopian eunuch. So this may have been a chief of the eunuchs in Jerusalem. So this is a Gentile. And he spoke on behalf of Jeremiah and Jeremiah was rescued out of that, that dungeon and didn't die. So this is for this Ethiopian. This is Jeremiah 39, 15 through 18. Meanwhile, the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison. So this is where he was when Babylon came. He was in prison initially. So saying, go and speak to Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for adversity and not for good. This is exactly the doom he's pronounced upon them. And they shall be performed in that day before you. So this Ethiopian is going to see this uh, tragedy, the day of the Lord falling upon the people in Jerusalem. But verse 17, But I will deliver you in that day. So God is sovereign over life and death. He's bringing death upon many of the people in Jerusalem but he's saving this Ethiopian. He says, I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hand of the men whom you are afraid. For I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you. This prize is a gift that's been given to him because, and I, let's underline that, because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. You know, shameful things as we read this. You got that pagan leader of the Babylonians who said, 
You know, you know God, your God spoke and he fulfilled it. He sees it obvious. He believed it. And now we have a Gentile, an Ethiopian, who trusted God. And because he trusted God, God rescued him. You see, Judah and Israel as a whole, really, were always meant to be a witness nation. They were supposed to be a witness to people what it meant to be holy, what it meant to follow God, to be a people of God. Another one for the sovereignty of, over life and death is Jeremiah 43 and 11. And you really see the sovereign, the fact that God is in control in this verse. When he comes, he shall strike the land of Egypt. So this is after they get into Egypt. And this is going to happen. He will strike the land of Egypt and deliver to death those appointed for death. What does it mean, those who are appointed for death? He goes on. Into captivity, those appointed for captivity. And to the sword, those appointed for the sword. What are we reading there? God has his judgment. And God has said, this person is going to die by the sword. This person is going to go into captivity. This person is appointed for death. God is in control. And again, he warned the people. He gave them the option of life or death, and they refused to listen to him. But judgment came upon Judah. But as we'll see as we go in these next chapters too, but we'll kind of start it tonight, as judgment is coming against the wicked nations as well. So not just Judah, who really was a wicked nation at this point, but all these other nations around them that worship false gods would be judged too. They would not be spared. Jeremiah 46 and 10 for this is the day of the Lord, God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge himself on his adversaries. So this is the day of the Lord. Now that is a term that is used often in prophecy. Sometimes it's talking about the end of all things. But sometimes it's talking about a particular day of judgment. And this particular day of judgment is against Egypt. And we'll see that he'll mention more nations as we go through the rest of Jeremiah. But he is... It's a, the day of the Lord is a day of vengeance that he may avenge himself on his adversaries. So those that are opposed to God, the rebels. The sword shall devour. It shall be satiated and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. They were going to be judged. God was going to judge the nations. And as we look at history, you know, Babylon was coming in to be used as an instrument of judgment against Jerusalem, but was the Babylon get off free from... No, they were judged as well. And this was just the reality of all nations that do not follow God are going to be judged. They're going to be judged. But here, as we've seen in other passages in Jeremiah, here's that glimmer of hope. God remains faithful even when the people have been faithless. This is Jeremiah 46, 27 through 28. We see that God will preserve a faithful remnant of Israel. And you see, he does actually mention it as Israel here, not just Judah, but the people as a whole. It says, But do not fear, O my servant Jacob, and do not be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar, and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be at ease. No one shall make him afraid. So you can think about those that are in captivity, those that have been taken away. This is a word of hope for them, isn't it? God hasn't forgotten them. Even though they have forgotten God for so long, God had not forgotten His promise through Abraham that all nations would be blessed. Israel still had a great purpose. And He said He's going to save them from afar, so no matter what lands they are in, He's going to save their offspring, no matter where they are, where they're spread out across the world. And it says, Jacob shall return, or Israel shall return, and have rest and be at ease. Now as we look at the Holy Land today, are they at rest and at ease? There's prophecy still to be fulfilled. In God's timing and in God's way, Israel will return to the Promised Land. And we've talked about this before too, that really the Promised Land is sort of a picture of heaven, isn't it? We talk about heaven like the promised land. And in this promised land, if they were obedient to God, they were going to have rest and they were going to be at ease and no one should make them afraid. Basically, the enemies against them would never win if they were in God's will. So there's still a day to come. It says, verse 28, 
Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, says the Lord, for I am with you, for I will make a complete end of all the nations to which I have driven you. All these pagan nations, they're going to be judged. This passage is actually at the end of the passage about judgment against Egypt. It says, but I will make, I will not make a complete end of you. So he's going to make a complete end of all the pagan nations, but he will not make a complete end of Israel. I will rightly correct you, for I will not leave you wholly unpunished. Here's the reality. God was not wanting to destroy Israel. He was correcting them. And there was always a faithful remnant of Israel throughout history. There's a faithful remnant of Israel today. Who was the first church? It was Jewish people. It was Jewish people. And there will be another turning, a great turning to Christ in the end. But look at this. He's correcting them. He's not leaving them unpunished for their sin. And God's word continues to say, wake up. Listen. You know, if your, your life is in shambles and it's in a mess, there may be very good reason for that if you're living contrary to what God is calling you to be. This is a word for the church. If we're not being obedient to God, we should expect correction. God calls us to be holy because He is holy. So as we look at chapters 39 through 47, we see that God's word will come to pass just as Jeremiah had told the people, Babylon arrived. The pagan nation of Babylon had recognized that God's prophecy had been fulfilled as well. His word will come to pass. And those who listen, they are safe in the Lord. So some people didn't die. Some people went to Babylon. So those that listen are safe in the Lord. But those who refuse to listen will be judged. So those that were fighting, like Zedekiah and his sons, they faced judgment. Now the people, as they went to Egypt, they didn't listen to God. They faced judgment. God's word is for our good. It is for our good. We also see that God is sovereign over life and death. We see that God will judge all the wicked nations. And God will preserve a faithful remnant of Israel. You know, with that reality... As we look at the wars in Israel, it always makes us think about the end times and about how God's going to wrap things up. And honestly, we don't know all the details. God has given us what we need to know for life and godliness, but we don't know all the details of it. He's warned us that we need to trust Him. We need to walk with Him. And as Jesus says in Matthew 24, that the biggest thing is we need to be ready for it to all wrap up. We need to be ready for Jesus' return. And we need to be faithful. We need to be doing the work that He's called us to. And what is the biggest work that He has called us to as the church? It's really the same thing that He called Israel to. To be that witness nation. To fulfill the Great Commission. And sadly, we look a lot like the pagan nations around us. The church. So, it's a word of warning but also a word of comfort knowing that those who listen to the Lord are safe in the Lord. Anybody got anything to add? A lot of good stuff in Jeremiah. I really have enjoyed this book greatly. But we will pick up again chapter 48 next week and see how far we can go. Is there 52 chapters? I can't remember exactly. 50-something, I think. Maybe more. But, uh, yeah, we should be wrapping up everything pretty soon. But thank you all for y'all's faithfulness as well in coming out each week. I know that these studies can be a little mind-blowing at some times, but I hope y'all are, I hope y'all are learning some things. I know I'm learning some things as I dig deeper into it and kind of look at it in this, this view of, you know, life and death and heaven and hell and, you know, what God has called us to be as His people. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I do thank you for your word tonight. And I thank you for the great truth that we know that we are safe in Jesus Christ. I thank you that you have given us your word, that your word has been given to us for rebuke, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that we can be a complete people, 
a holy people, as you have called us to be holy. You never call us to be any less than that. We are to be a witness nation. We are to be a witness with our lives, have a testimony of what is in our heart, the things that we say and the things that we do, and that we would be faithful in not only just living out the gospel, but sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And the gospel always includes the reality of sin and judgment, that there is a hell, that there is a judgment day, but that there is good news that Jesus has taken that punishment for all those who call upon His name. I thank You that as we look at the wars and rumors of wars that You have warned us of, Lord, that we don't have to be concerned because we know that if we are ready and we are faithful, we're not going to be taken by surprise at the return of our Lord. And I thank You that again we will be okay. And I pray for our nation that You would just Bring a great revival among your people and that we would be faithful in living out the holiness that you've called us to and telling others the good news. And I pray for the nations around the world, Lord, just all the, the uproar that's going on and the loss of life in Israel and the Gaza Strip. I pray that you'd bring good out of that situation, Lord. I pray that you would just shake people, that they would know that there is a judgment day, that they would know that one day they'll stand before you. And I pray that they're, they'll be ready. And I pray that your hand will just continue to be seen in our individual lives as we seek you, as we know you better, Lord, that you would purify us, that you would make us into the people that you desire us to be. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.